From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The House of Representatives passes a tax cut for big business while expanding the child tax credit, and more Republicans vote against it than Democrats. Is this good policy, and will it pass the Senate? Plus, the Senate border security talks continue behind the scenes, but may end up coming to naught. Where does that leave the border debate and funding for Ukraine? Welcome. I'm Paul Jago with the Wall Street Journal Opinion Pages here on our Potomac Watch podcast. And I'm here with my colleagues, Kim Strassel and Kate Batchelder odell So the tax bill that was negotiated between Democrat Ron Wyden, who runs the Senate Finance Committee, and Jason Smith, who runs the House Ways and Means Committee and is a Republican, went to the House last night. That was a Wednesday night and passed with a vote of 357 to 70. Interestingly, 188 Democrats voted for it, 23 against but 169 Republicans voted for it and 47 Republicans opposed. So despite the fact that Republicans control the House of Representatives, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson introduced a bill that more Democrats like than (laughs) Republicans. And not only that, but a tax bill, which is supposed to be, of course, the thing that at least Republicans are most unified on. Kate, why don't you tell us what's in this tax bill? Well, I mean, Paul, one of the narratives we've been hearing over the past 12 hours is that this is a rare breakthrough of bipartisanship. But is there any older story in the book than Congress spending a bunch of money and doing some temporary tax extender sops? Um, I think not. In other words, this isn't a tremendous political breakthrough. (laughs) Yes, no, it's just, uh, like I said, backing up the spending truck. What's in the bill is what Republicans wanted were some provisions from the 2017 tax cuts, bonus depreciation for equipment, some changes to the way companies deduct our research and development expenses. And then what they traded for it with Democrats was a blowout in the child tax credit and some changes to the way that it's administered by basically allowing, for instance, if you claim it, you can use your earnings from last year to calculate your credit for this year. So that weakens the credits connection with work and upward mobility. So it'll be an expensive tax bill for not very many substantive, no, really a very small growth effect, if any, over the long haul because it's temporary, but a huge price tag. Yeah, the price tag formally cited by the Joint Tax Committee, which measures these things for Congress, is $78 billion. But because of the way it's structured, that Dan Clifton of Strategus Research Partners figures that in the first two years alone, it's actually going to be a tax cut upwards of $200 billion, in part because it is going to allow the uh, Internal Revenue Service to start making payments again for the employee retention credit, which is really a boondoggle for the ages coming out of the uh, COVID pandemic, which allows companies to claim credit for keeping employees on the payroll. Even if they did this years ago during the pandemic, they can still claim it. And there are upwards of $244 billion of unclaimed ERC credits. So Kim, this looks like, despite all the anxiety expressed by Republicans about the deficit, this looks like it's going to add to the deficit. Well, and by the way, Paul, just a funny side note on that employee retention credit. (laughs) They actually, in Congress's classic gimmicky way, suggested that, well, yeah, you know, you can use this program. We're going to start paying this out um, again. We've got new provisions to crack down on fraud. And so actually, it might even save us money in the end, which is just such a classic Congress line. I mean, the thing that strikes me when I look at this is it's just like everything that happened under Nancy Pelosi. I mean, why even bother changing parties? This is entirely in line with the semiconductor welfare bill, with the infrastructure bill that we saw come out, with the Inflation Reduction Act. And some of these had bipartisan majorities, too, because it turns out that about the only thing that this Congress can ever pass anymore is spending. They can lock arms and do it. They can claim they're both getting their own priorities. But it's the only thing that they seem to be able to get past their rancor and get over the finish line. And this, to me, looks no different than anything else, it's going to raise the deficit. But it's also just terrible policy. And more importantly, it's the hook 
Democrats want to continue to grow that child tax credit and to make it ever more refundable, turning it into a, a permanent welfare feature. Refundable refers to the provision that says that you can get the tax credit even if you have no tax liability, so that in essence it becomes a welfare check, right? The government sends you a check, yeah, for not working. So that's what refundable means. Let's listen to the House Ways and Means chairman, Jason Smith. He's chairman for the first time in this Congress. And I have to say it shows. Let's listen to him on CNBC. Trump's tax cuts in 2017 increased the refundability to $1,400 indexed to inflation. It is currently, as we stand, $1,700. It's not $1,600. It's $1,700. This bill increases its $100 every year over the next three years, just like what Trump's tax package did as well. Of course, the Wall Street Journal is not going to be favorable because this tax policy is focused on working families, small businesses, and Main Street, not Wall Street. Um, the Ways and Means chairman there taking us to task for our editorials, pointing out that the child tax credit isn't exactly what he says it is. And I have to say, it's amusing. He claims we don't like this because it helps working families. Actually, it's more help for people who don't work. That's our objection to it. It hurts work, number one. And number two, this is a big business bill, Kate. I mean, that's what this is. The Republicans are doing this mainly because the business lobbies are all for it. It does take some chutzpah to accuse somebody else of being a shill for Wall Street when you're blowing through a expansion of the net interest deduction. For corporate America. And I was going to go into some detail on that very briefly, but I think it's important because in the 2017 tax reform, there was a discussion and a fight over how companies could calculate their net interest for deduction. And the forces of good argued for this tighter calculation because it would keep the code from subsidizing debt financing over equity. And so now basically what the House is doing is undoing that pro-growth reform that Congress used to help pay for the Trump tax cuts. So this is not even a pro-growth good provision. It's an undoing of 2017. We're going to take a break. and When we come back, we'll talk a little more about this uh, tax bill and its prospects in the Senate. And where does the debate negotiation stand on Ukraine and border security when we come back? Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with The Wall Street Journal with uh, Kim Strassel and Kate O'Dell. Let's uh, look forward on the tax bill to the Senate. And what are the prospects there? Clearly, the Democrats really want this. Ron Wyden, the head of the Finance Committee, negotiated it. The Democrats seem enthused. The president and the White House have endorsed it. So this will hang, Kim, on whether or not Republican senators can hang together and oppose it or, well, they'll just say, well, it's an election year and we'll let the tax benefits roll. So far, there does seem to be some pushback and from some important voices in the caucus and for a medley of reasons. They're not necessarily all united on why they disapprove of this bill, but that might not matter in the end if there is enough of them to, in essence, block it or get the momentum to block it overall. Some people obviously don't like the watering down of some of these provisions like Kate was mentioning because they remember that fight that happened in particular in the Senate to try to tighten up that interest deduction provision. Some of them uh, obviously understand our point about this becoming a welfare bill and a permanent welfare feature of our system. And then you've got a couple people that I think in their heart of hearts would actually like the whole thing to be even bigger, and they're grumpy for that reason. Will that keep them from voting for it? Possibly not. All of this, meanwhile, gets thrown into the fray of the big discussion about Conflicting priorities here. Let's not forget that we are talking about doing this enormous new handout at a time when Congress is pleading poverty and claiming they don't have the money to fund our allies in these world conflicts like Ukraine. And that seems to be an argument that's picking up a little traction, too. Kate, just to broaden this out a bit, in 2017, Republicans passed a tax reform that they called a generational achievement. And in many ways, it was. Fixed the corporate code in particular. The individual side wasn't as good. But they fixed the corporate side pretty well. And they did it in narrowing loopholes like the interest deduction benefit for interest over equity and other loopholes. And yet now they are busy pairing that back. And it leads me to wonder, 
what do Republicans stand for anymore? There seems to be an enormous amount of intellectual confusion in the Republican Party now across all kinds of things that they used to believe, from foreign policy to tax policy to social welfare policy. Well, there is a split. There are some Republican outside groups supporting this, and they tend to lean pretty hard on bonus depreciation as worth the entire price tag of the rest of the package. But I'm really concerned about you have some Republicans here that are defending this expansion of the refundable child tax credit as a good cultural priority. For example, there's a provision in the bill that would basically really juice up the credits at the lower ends of the income scale for families with multiple children. And this is being pitched as just, oh, we're just correcting a tax bias against large families. But what it really does is phase in and what that means is just give these checks at lower levels of income and lower levels of work. And it changes the way that the credit works. And it basically means you'll get your full check faster. And so you won't have the incentive to work an extra hour. You won't have the incentive to take a job that pays $3 more per hour. And what we really supposedly want, or what I thought Republicans wanted, was to use these social safety programs to the extent they exist and to help people get out of poverty and be upwardly mobile. And we're now reverting to these social programs as just a simply, let's send a check and declare victory. And I think that is just a real depressing development. Yeah, it also plays into democratic policy and political hands, I should say, which is one of the reasons I think that Democrats are smiling throughout this whole process, because their goal with the child tax credit is to make that into essentially a universal basic income for all Americans. And this is something of a down payment on that. Now, Republicans have already gone a large part of that way in the past. But at least when they did that, they would say, well, we need it to get what we want on tax policy. In this case, they're actually defending the credit and defending the incentives for not working, which is very destructive. Mm 